people in ancient time, you know, monasteries, viharas. And that's why it's called vihar even till today, even though there's no more vihar there. Now, <coughs> and hundreds of Brahmins and kings, Kshetra kings, like King Prasenjit, King Bibisa, King Ajavasamdru, and so on. <coughs> the Malla kings, they all came to meet him and became his disciples. And Brahmins came and questioned him and became his disciples. Actually, there are many interesting parts, but we can't go through all of them. <laughs> uh, Drona the Brahma, a uh, Brahma in Dona Sutta, in the Pali text of Aguntar Nikara, asked the Buddha the question Devo no Bhava Bhavishati, are you a Deva? And he replied, Nako am Brahmana, Devo, Devo Bhava Bhavishamiti. No Brahman, I am not a Deva. Then he asked him, <coughs> Are you a Yaksha? No. Are you a Gandharva? No. Then he asked a very interesting question. One human being does not turn to another human being and ask, Are you human? Uh, will you turn back and say, Are you human? <laughs> Drona asked Buddha, Are you Manushya? And Buddha said, No Brahman. No Brahman. I am not a Manushya. Then Drona asked, then how do we know you as? Uh, and he replied, Buddha di ma Brahmana dhare. Understand me as the Buddha. This slok has many multiple layers of meaning if you analyze it. One is that a Buddha is a totally different category from Devas and these type of things. Devas can also become Buddhas if they go through the, the, the regime, regime, you know, if they go through the regime. But a Buddha is not a Deva. <coughs> that is why when Indian people say Buddha Deva, it's not correct. You know, it's a misunderstanding. But you do find Devas calling him Deva Di Dev. Because he is Sasta Deva Manushyana. Sasta means teacher, guru, Deva Manushyana, Deva of Devas and Manushya. Now, then, as he got older, a very interesting thing happened. One Deva called Mara Deva in Buddhist terminology came down to him. Came down, but before that, he told Ananda, his own cousin and his attendant, a Buddha can live for a kalpa. And the Theravada tradition says that the kalpa means 100 years. He was like 84 or something. And uh, Ananda listened to that and he repeated that three times. Then Ananda just didn't, didn't do anything at all. He should have requested. Please then live on till 100 years at least. Or a kalpa, you know. But he didn't do that. Then Ananda went out into the jungle. And those days, vast tracts of India was all jungle. And then this Deva came down and said, Bhagavan, it's time for you to go. It's time for you to go. Please go. This is a very interesting point. You see, in the Brihat Aranya Upanishad, which is part of the Veda, considered as part of the Veda, but it is Purva Mimamsa, the Uttar Mimamsa, not Purva Mimamsa. There is a slok. Yatha Havai Bhava Pasho Manusham Bhaju, Evam Ekeka Purusho Devam Bhunati, Ekaspin Neva Pasavadi Amani, Apriyam Bhavati, Kibu Bhosho, Tasma Esam, Tanna Priyam, Mere, Tan Manusha Vidyu, which means just like a shepherd or a coward. Even if one cattle is lost, it hurts him so much. No. These humans are flocks of cattle for these devas. Which is true. The majority of humanities worship these devas like they are the cattle or the slave of those devas. You know, Prabhu, Tom Saram and those kind of things. Right? And <coughs> if a human being becomes enlightened, he goes higher than those devas. 
So therefore, they lose a whole flock of cattle. And therefore, Tasman Esam Tanna Priyam. I suppose in, as Indians you can understand that much. Tanna Priyam. You know, Yede, this thing, Yed Manusha, Manusha, with you, no. Then the Buddha said, Don't worry, Ma. I have decided to leave my body three months from now. Then there was an earthquake, but no light. <coughs> no light. And eight kings from all of different parts of you know, the, during that period in the northern part of India, they were what is called the 16 Mahajanapadas. So after them, eight kings were already there. <coughs> he had given special instruction on how to cremate his body. And after he was, his body was cremated, in the Sanskrit terminology, we call it Sharir Dhatu. If a person is enlightened, he does not die an ordinary death. There is a Tibetan saying, great yogi, great pundit, at the time of death, an ordinary corpse. Means the, the guy was a thug. You know, he, he was not really enlightened. If a person is enlightened, his death is never going to be ordinary. He is not going to die, his body swell up and start stinking rigor mortis immediately. My own guru passed away five or six years, how many years I forgot now? Eight years. Eight, eight years ago. Ten years. Ten. Okay, ten years ago. He stayed like this after stopping breath for ten days, uh, seventeen days. And we brought the doctor in on the seventeenth day to certify so that we can do the rest of the ritual and cremate him and so on. And the doctor just would not believe that he had stopped breathing 17 days ago. He said, this is beyond medical science. It can't happen. As a doctor, I can't believe it. You know, and either you guys are lying or something, something is happening here. That, that's what the doctor said. But he stayed 17 days like this. And seven or eight of my teachers, some five days, some three days, some 10 days, like that. It's not a rare case. See, it's in the Tibetan tradition, which is an unbroken, enlightened knowledge. Shuddha Siddha Parampara. <coughs> masters are still going like that. And there are other ways masters go also. And I'll, I'll talk about it later. When, when it's cremated, then the ashes have small beads like things like jewels, pearls, all over. And if you take one of one of them, if you're given one of them and you keep it in a box in your shrine and you read it <coughs> faith and you open the box after six months or one year, you'll find four of them there. You had put only one there. You'll find four of them. This keeps on expanding. If you have no faith, you know, and you actually had no faith in you, and you open after six months, there's nothing there. It vanishes. These are manifestations of an enlightened being. And as I said, it happened in the time of Buddha and it continues through the century in an unbroken lineage. And my own guru, our gurus actually, seven or eight of them, you know, uh, same thing, all the same thing happened. There are some in Thailand, northern part of Thailand, Parats, who also pass away like that and they live behind the ring, what is called Sarin Dhatus. But in the Theravada tradition, this is decreasing. Uh, it is becoming more intellectual than meditative experiential. But uh, just doing a little bit of vipassana does not produce that. The vipassana is only a small part of the holistic path. And that's very interesting because that's very ancient record. But recently, my own great grand uncle, he you know, in the political family feud. He was kind of uh, exiled from Kathmandu, so he came to Ram Gram and wanted to build a palace there. And he didn't know that that was a stupa, and so he was planning to break it down and level it, level it, and uh, make it palace. And exactly the same thing happened. Navas came out, and he stayed three months trying to do it and gave up, gave up on it. So then the Buddhism gradually spread. Uh, all over India, very fast actually, especially after King Ashok. But then even before Ashok, it was already spreading. 
because it is very rational, very logical, and experiential. And uh, the Buddha would never claim that what I said is the truth, and you should follow it because I am the Buddha. He always said, Ehi Pasiko, come and see for yourself whether this is the truth or not. No. And that attitude is always there in Buddhism. But for 2,600 years, he has been proven right. You know, those who practice it and go through the process, find that it happens exactly as the Buddha said. <laughs> and because of that, Brahmins and all castes, you know, actually, Buddhism does not believe in a caste. I keep repeating Brahmins and so on because there is this uh, wrong misconception in the Indian subcontinent that uh, Buddhism is not the dharma of the Brahmins. And the history shows otherwise. There were thousands and thousands of Brahmins who were Buddha's disciples immediately and later centuries. The 84 Mahasiddhas are only 84 out of thousands and thousands uh, <coughs> recorded by Arya Sumri. Abhayaka. Abhayaka. Yeah, Abhayaka. Recorded by Abhayaka. The 84 Mahasiddhas is translated into English also, but there are short clips of stories only. Uh, out, of the, out of the 84, 60 to 70 percent are Brahmins and Chetris, the remaining 25 percent are other cars. But of course, uh, and I'm emphasizing this because this misconception exists in the media Indian subcontinent that it is not the Dharma of the Brahmins. You know? In Nepal, uh, among the Brahmins and Chetris caste, they think Buddhism in the Tibet is the Dharma of the Tibetans, you know, Tibetans. And most probably, most Indians think that Buddhism is a foreign dharma, you know, and Hinduism is our dharma. But Buddha attained enlightenment in the Bodh Gaya. He taught in UP and uh, Bihar area. His disciples were all Indians, virtually all were Indians, you know, except the Sakyas were in Lumini, you know, Lumini, they are all uh, Indians, and they spread it all over the world. And the <coughs> people who spread it all over the world were mostly Brahmins and Chetris. Mahindra, the son of King Ashok, took it to Sri Lanka. Vasubandhu and Asamra were born in Afghanistan. They were Brahmins. Sakyasri Bhadra, the head of Nalanda, when Nalanda was destroyed, was a Kashmiri Brahmin. Adisha, the king. The son of the king of Bengal you know, went to Tibet. He became the head of Nalanda and then left and went to Tibet and passed away in Tibet. And there's a very interesting story. During the Cultural Revolution, when the, Tibet, uh, the Chinese were destroying all the Tibetan monasteries, there were two monasteries saved. And uh, one was Atisha's because the Communist Party of Bengal wrote a letter to Mao Zedong that our Atisha's remains and uh, things are there. If you don't want them, please send it to us. So Mao Zedong gave a special order to not to touch it. And another monastery, the monastery whose lineage I belong to, it's called Sakya. A very interesting story that uh, in Tibet and in Nepal, especially in northern Nepal, all the monasteries are built at the top of the mountains. And this monastery was at the bottom of the two mountains coming like this. When he, Sachin Kumba Ningpo, uh, inaugurated it, he invited all the lineage masters and they all asked him this question, why have you built it here? And he said, because I built it down here, one day this monastery will be saved. That was 1100. <coughs> In 1959, when the Chinese got used to you know, pointing the cannon up and looking at monastery, monastery at the top, they didn't see the one down there, so they missed it. And likewise, they gradually came right up to South India, up to Kerala. As you can see, many caves all over India, southern parts of Azamda and so on, and uh, Kanari Can Can and even here, I think there are places there, caves where Buddhist monks used to meditate and so on, and spread right through and into Sri Lanka as well. And for example, Bodhi Ruchi was an Indian who took uh, Arab 
Abraham, who took Badre and to China. It is called Chenyan. <coughs> it's a minor school in China and Japan, but it is there, still alive. And it went on to Japan, it's called uh, Kego, Kego, uh, Shinmo, Shinmo, uh, uh, Shu, Shinmo, Shu means school, Shinmo, Shu, and, and Tomoro Batra from Nepal went to China. In fact, uh, one of the biggest, the first big civilization that Buddhism entered and was taken by Indians and Nepalese was China. China was the first huge civilization. Uh, uh, Sri Lanka, it was already, it already went to Sri Lanka first, but Sri Lanka was a small country, you know. China was a huge empire. And uh, then many Chinese started coming to study in India. And the first, second, third, third, fourth century, sixth century, not first century, sixth century, fourth century, sixth century, and so on, right through Winsa, uh, Yijing, Fahe, uh, these uh, Chinese uh, gurus came to study in Nalanda, Vikramsi, all of the various places. And around 680, when some records that at the time when he was studying in Nalanda, there were 10,000 people studying from all over the world. And 10,000 is not a big number in India today, but we have to remember that of 680. 680, 10,000 is a huge number. And he says from Antioch in Greece, Alexander in Egypt, Iran, Central Asia, Indonesia, all these, all these various places. And he himself was a Chinese, he was a brilliant Chinese. <coughs> and so uh, the gurus, Indian gurus teaching there, requested, requested him to stay on and teach. And he taught for another six years right there. Then he traveled around India and he has left tra written travelogues. And uh, so Buddhism spread, and it is said that 275 percent of the Indian subcontinent, uh, Indian subcontinent means not just only India, Afghanistan is also part of the Indian subcontinent. So, you know, and 75 percent of Asia was Buddhist once. So the question is uh, what happened? How did it completely vanish from the Indian subcontinent? Especially India. We know how it vanished in, let's say, Pakistan and Afghanistan, it was an Islamic invasion. How it vanished from Iran, Uzbekistan, Tajikistan, Uz uh, Turkmenistan, is Islamic invasion. That's the Silk Route that goes to China. You know? But you still have Buddhist Mahayan monasteries, uh, remains of Mahayan monasteries in the Silk Route, throughout the Silk Route. But well, how did it vanish from India today? No. Where it started and from where it spread all over the world. Japan, Korea, Vietnam, Cambodia, Laos, Thailand, Burma, Sri Lanka, and all the whole Central Asia area, including Iran, you know, Afghanistan, and what is called Pakistan today. No. This is a very difficult question for Indians to digest. <laughs> so you brace yourself, please. <laughs> brace yourself, please. But uh, during the second century and the beginning of the second century, the <coughs> remaining Hindus <coughs> started creating uh, a series of Puranas: Hari Bhaksa Puran, Vishnu Puran, Garuda Puran. Padma Puran, Linga Puran, Agni Puran, and so on. You know, many, many Puran, Skanda Puran, Naradiya Puran, and uh, Parasarya Horasastra, Mahavora Shastra. In this, the Buddha is called an incarnation of Vishnu. Now, there are two points here. First, we've already seen that the Buddha denied he was any kind of deva. So that's wrong. And we Buddhists uh, would not mind if the Hindus want to call him the incarnation of Vishnu because the Vishnu is their god and so they will give him a status to him and if that would I mean, nothing for us, although we don't agree to it. However, these texts, these 11 or so set texts, uh, Bhagavad Puran, you know, 
have all sorts of mixed up things inside there. But number one is the story that Asuras started defeating the Devas because they practiced Veda. So all the Devas went to Vishnu and requested for that. <coughs> and Vishnu said, don't worry, I'll send the worst aspect of me, you know, Maya Moha Avta, which will deceive the Asuras and they will leave the Vedas and they will become weaker and weaker and weaker and you will become better off. So that's the story. A Buddha is a deceptive avatar. Maya Moha. His teachings are supposed to be deceptive. Now, there's a discrepancy in this story, this storyline, in all these 11 or so Puranas, that if the Buddha is Vishnu's incarnation, and a Maya Moha incarnation, to deceive the Asuras, why was he not born in the Asura Loka and teach the doctor out of Asuras? Why was he born in human Loka and taught, taught the humans? No, it doesn't make sense. And this way, these Puranas were made from 2nd century approximately to up to 15th century. <coughs> and it's not like one Purana is made in one period. It's the same Purana have different timelines. You find names of kings of 11th century in Harimangsa, for example, and kings of well, 6th century. So it means they were added up and collected through the centuries. So that is one strategy they applied, but it didn't seem to work. It didn't seem to work too much. Then came, uh, uh, I'm sorry, I know all of you are mostly from Hindu background. I was also from a Hindu background, and when I read through all this, it shocked me. You know, is that persecution of Buddhists began by Hindus? This is something you've never heard of, and you, as Hindus, I know as Hindus today, you can't think of. But historically, it happened, and it is necessary to know it. We can't see it under the rock. No, under the world, it is necessary to know it and so that it will not happen again between Hindus and Buddhists. <coughs> and it began specifically from Sankaracharya and Kumara Bhatta. Kumara Bhatta used the army of King Sudhanga of Kerala to kill every Buddhist in Kerala and wipe out stupas and bihars and all these things. This is written in Sankar Digvijaya and Sankar Vijaya, two of the oldest biographies of Sankar Chandra. There are 11 biographies, in fact there are 21, but 11 are cons considered as authentic and out of these 11, the two are the oldest. But Sankar Digvijaya by Mad Madhav Vidyaranya and Sankar Vijaya by Anandakini. And then Sankaracharya, normally nowadays in the Indian subcontinent people think that Sankaracharya, Digvaya Vijaya means he went up and down the Indian subcontinent and defeated the Buddhists and that is how Buddhism collapsed, you know, in a Tibet. Now this is false. Why? Number one, neither Sankar Digvijaya nor Sankar Vijaya, Vijaya show him debating with Buddhists. He debated mostly with other non-Advaita Hindus. One. Second, he has, I say, tried to refute Buddhist thesis in the Brahma Sutra Bhasya called Sarira Bhasya of Sankaracharya. But you can see that he did not understand the Buddhist thesis. Therefore, his refutation is completely wrong. Because he is refuting something else that Buddhists are not talking about. For example, his refutation of Shunyata in the Brahma Sutra Bhasa is Sarva Pramana Vipati Siddha, means totally illogical. Shunyata, which means he understood Shunyata as hollow nothingness. And the question was, how can everything come out of hollow nothingness? is totally nonsense. No? Now, that means he didn't understand the Buddhist Sunnita at all. No? 
And as I said, he did not really debate with Buddhists. Like people in Nalanda, Vikramashi, which are existing there, Odanda Puri, Sawapuri, Jagadala, and so on, they were still existing. You know? I'm sure if he had debated with them, he would have lost. Because he did not understand, understand Buddhist thesis at all. And, but that is, uh, more than that, is unfortunately, very unfortunately, for the name that he has created, the create, that has been created of him in the Indian subcontinent, goes against what actually happened. Because he also took the army of King Sudanwa, and wherever he went up and down to India, where there were no Buddhist kings to protect them, he killed Buddhists. And destroyed Stubas and destroyed Bihars. And <coughs> this is very unfortunate. This is the beginning of Hindu persecution of Buddhists. Then many kings, Hindu kings, were uh, inspired by that. King Sasant of Bengal went and cut the Bodhi tree and burned the stump. But fortunately for Buddhists, another sprout came out from there. Likewise, Pushyamitra, who killed uh, Ashok's great 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 grandson and became uh, the, uh, the emperor of Magadha, also persecuted Buddhists. But then his dynasty is a little bit mixed up because his grandsons were Buddhists again. So it was back and forth. You know? It's not all Hindus, all, all Brahmins. There were, there were Brahmins and Hindus who did this. You know? During that period, many Brahmins hid Buddhists in their house to protect them. So it's both ways. It's not like Brahmins are, are the cause of this, or Hindus are the cause of this. For example, Mihir Pur, the Hun king, a Shaivite king of Kashmir, in the Raja Tarangani, written by Kalana. He was the recorder of the, the Kashmir kings. And Ras Tarangiri, he writes that he destroyed 16,000 stupas from Kashmir to Afghanistan and took away the lands of the Buddhists and gave it to Brahmins. But to be fair to Brahmins, a large number of Brahmins refused to take those lands. Some took it. And many Brahmins hid Buddhists in their house to protect from persecution. So it's both ways. The, but the persecution did happen. And then you have when Min San in 6th century was in, uh, had come to Nalanda, King Ramashankar sent a letter saying, present him to my court, otherwise I will come and destroy Nalanda. So Min San had to go and meet him. This is Min San's own writing in his travels.